in contrast to the long-range GABAergic projection neurons that we considered in the last video, many GABAergic neurons in the brain don't have long-range axonal projections. They have local axons that maybe stretch some hundreds of microns, and they're often termed GABAergic interneurons for that reason. They regulate the activity of the local microcircuits in which they're embedded. The inhibitory neurons of the neural cortex are such local interneurons, and in general, they don't have long-range axonal projections. The GABAergic neurons of the neural cortex are a small fraction of the total number of neurons in the neural cortex. 85% of the neurons in the neural cortex are excitatory glutamatergic neurons, and that leaves about 15% of the cells as the GABAergic local inhibitory neurons. Despite the fact that there's not so many of them, they show a striking diversity in almost any feature that you care to analyze. The morphology of the cells is different, their electric physiological properties is different, their synaptic connectivity, and perhaps most importantly, in terms of characterizing the cell types, their molecular expression patterns are distinct and diverse. In this video, we're going to consider four different types of GABAergic neocortical neurons. We'll think about three types of GABAergic neurons that are defined through their expression of different marker genes. So we'll discuss GABAergic neurons that express parvalbumin, we'll discuss others that express somatostatin, and others that express vasoactive intestinal peptide. And these are non-overlapping expression patterns, at least largely, so they're different classes of neurons that don't overlap with each other. And then finally, we'll talk about neuroglioform cells that at this time don't have a good molecular marker for them. We'll begin by talking about parvalbumin expressing GABAergic neurons. And in fact, we've already discussed these briefly in previous lectures when we were thinking about the action potential waveform. The parvalbumin expressing cells have fast spiking intrinsic electrophysiological properties. And so if you have one of these cells on your recording electrode in a brain slice, and you inject some depolarizing current into that cell, it'll depolarize and fire action potentials. And if you inject a lot of current into it, it'll fire action potentials at a very high rate. Some hundreds of hertz are the maximal firing rates of the fast spiking GABAergic neurons. If we zoom in on each individual action potential, we'll see that they have fast waveforms, and the AP half-width is something like 300 microseconds. And that contrasts with the glutamatergic excitatory pyramidal cells, where if you inject depolarizing current into them, they certainly fire action potentials, but the maximal firing rates are much lower than the fast-spiking parvalbum-expressing GABAergic neurons, about an order of magnitude lower. And each individual action potential in the glutamatergic cells has a broad waveform lasting more than a millisecond. The axonal output of the fast spiking parvalbumin expressing GABAergic cells comes in two different flavors, and there are two different types of PV parvalbumin expressing cells. The major one, the so called parvalbumin expressing basket cell, sends its axon close to the soma, and often it'll decorate the soma with a basket shape around the soma, causing a fast, hyperpolarizing IPSP mediated by GABA-A here at the soma or on proximal dendrites. The other type of parvalbumin-expressing cell specifically sends its axon to the axon initial segment of the excitatory pyramidal cells. These axoaxonic cells, or these chandelier cells, as they're also called, then target their inhibition to a very specific place of the pyramidal cells, the axon initial segment, where action potentials are typically thought to initiate. And so these cells specifically inhibit that area, and it may be that they leave dendritic integration in the main dendrites and soma of the cell largely untouched, and they specifically edit whether the cell is able to output an action potential or not. A very interesting type of cell.
The Pavalman expressing GABAergic neurons, especially this type of soma and proximal dendrite targeting cell, form the largest family of the GABAergic neurons in the neocortex. We can study the connectivity of these fast spiking Pavalman expressing GABAergic neurons in brain slices, where we can record from different neurons simultaneously and we can then initiate action potentials in different cells and study their synaptic connectivity. This brain slice is from a specific type of transgenic mouse that expresses green fluorescent protein in all the GABAergic neurons. And so we have green GABAergic neurons and the excitatory pyramidal cells, which form the majority of the cells here, are invisible, except when they're being recorded from, where we have the red fluorescence from the recording electrode that fills the soma and dendritic arborizations. And so cell 1 and cell 2 are excitatory pyramidal cells, and you might be able to make out the dendritic arborizations here. If we inject depolarizing current into these two cells, they fire action potentials with broad waveforms and at slow firing rates, typical of excitatory pyramidal cells. Recording electrode 3 is sitting on a cell here that's turned yellow. That's because it's a superposition of the red from the recording electrode and the green from the green fluorescent protein of the mouse, indicating that this is a GABAergic neuron. And upon injecting current into it, we see that it's a parvalbumin fast-spiking GABAergic neuron. And so we can study the synaptic connectivity between these three different cells by firing action potentials in each cell in turn. And if we evoke an action potential in cell 1, and we measure what happens in cell 2 and cell 3, we see that there's an excitatory postsynaptic potential in our fast-spiking GABAergic neuron. So these are synaptically connected. Not shown is that there's no impact upon cell 2. So cell 1 connects to cell 3, but not to cell 2. We can find action potential in cell 2, and we see that that also causes an excitatory postsynaptic potential in cell 3. And so both cell 1 and cell 2, our excitatory pyramidal cells, provide input onto the fast-spiking parvalbumin GABAergic neuron. And this type of connectivity is entirely typical. We saw in last week's lectures that excitatory neurons in the neocortex connect to each other with something like a 10% connection probability. On average, excitatory neurons and fast-spiking GABAergic neurons connect with something like 50% probability. So the connectivity of excited neurons is much higher onto these parvalbumin-expressing GABAergic neurons than it is onto other excited neurons. We can also evoke action potentials, of course, in the parvalbumin-expressing GABAergic neuron and see what happens in these inhibitory cells. And that's what we do here. An action potential is fired in cell 3, a fast-spiking GABAergic neuron, and that causes an inhibitory postsynaptic potential in cell 1. You can do the same here, fire an action potential in cell 3, and that also causes an IPSP in cell 2. And so cell 3 inhibits both cell 2 and cell 1, and so there are bidirectional synaptic connections here. In order to see these IPSPs, we have to depolarize the postsynaptic cell. And so here, we're not at the resting membrane potential, but we're depolarized to minus 50 millivolts, and same here. We have to depolarize the cell to minus 50 millivolts. And that's because, of course, the chloride reversal potential of the GABA-A receptor is sitting at around minus 70 millivolts. And so at resting membrane potential of cell 1 and cell 2, you don't see that IPSP. It's just a conductance. And the hyperpolarization is only visible if you depolarize the cell. This type of connectivity, where we have excitatory neurons that connect to other excitatory neurons with relatively low rates and very strong connectivity onto the inhibitory GABAergic neuron. Here we have about 50% connectivity, and equally the inhibitory connectivity is also strong. We see that this is a strong inhibitory loop. If there's more excitation in the excitatory neurons, that's rapidly going to be damped by this very strong inhibition. And in fact, the whole system here, at least in layer 2-3 of primary somatosensory cortex, is strongly overdamped. And so it's actually very difficult to get polysynaptic explosive excitation because of this very strong feedback inhibitory loop from the local parvalbumin-expressing fast-biting GABAergic neurons.
The second type of GABAergic neuron that I'd like to consider are the so-called somatosatin expressing GABAergic neurons. These neurons are particularly interesting because many of them send their axonal arborizations to a very specific region of the excitatory pyramidal cells. They target distal dendritic regions, and in particular, as we've seen in previous lectures, many of the excitatory pyramidal neurons have extensive arborizations here right at the top of the brain. So this is the outside of the brain, and this is the surface of the brain here, and there's a sort of a layer of the brain called layer one that has GABAergic neurons in it, but very few excitatory cells, mainly just synapses. And this is where the pyramidal cells extend that dendritic tuft region here, and that is a region that seems to be specifically targeted by the inhibition of the somatostatin expressing neurons. And there are very interesting inputs that arrive here in layer one. For example, if we're thinking about the primary somatosensory cortex of the mouse, then signals from the motor cortex arrive here specifically in layer one. And so it may be that the somatostatin cells are specifically involved in gating the input of motor information into the primary somatosensory cortex. A very interesting role of this distal dendritic innovation that somatostatin cells might drive. Another fascinating feature of the somatostatin cells is that they receive facilitating excitatory synaptic input from the nearby pyramidal cells. And so if this is a pyramidal cell that's synaptically connected to a somatostatin cell, if we fire a single action potential, then the EPSP recorded here in the somatostatin cell is relatively small and variable in amplitude, but if we fire repetitive action potentials at high frequency, say at 50 hertz, as in this example, then the EPSP amplitude grows and it becomes much larger than it was on the first action potential. And so this is typical of presynaptic facilitation, an increase in the neurotransmitter release probability that occurs at the presynaptic end of the specialization. And this facilitation is very specific onto the somatostatin cells. The same presynaptic neuron targeting a parvalbumin expressing cell will not show facilitation. Rather, it'll show something constant or perhaps even something that's depressing. And so there's something very specific about the synapses made here onto somatostatin cells as opposed to parvalbum cells, even from the same axon of the same presynaptic neuron, that give it remarkably different properties in terms of what's sensed postsynaptically. And so there's something interesting occurring here in the somatostatin cells where they seem to be integrating burst of action potentials from the pyramidal cells over longer periods of time when they can become strongly depolarized in response to trains of action potentials. And that is unique to the somatostatin cells. There's no other cells in the neocortex that have such prominence in synaptic facilitation. The VIP expressing GABAergic neurons are also extremely interesting. VIP stands for vasoactive intestinal peptide, and we don't know what the functional role of VIP is in the neocortex, but we can use it as a useful marker for a cell type in the brain. And in the neocortex, the VIP cells seem to have a specific role in inhibiting other GABAergic neurons. So they release GABA here, they inhibit cells, and the cells that they inhibit are not the excitatory cells, but there are the somatostatin cells, and a little bit less, the pavalbin cells. And so the VIP cells, rather than causing overall inhibition in the neocortical microcircuit, actually cause excitation, and they do that via disinhibition. The last type of neocortical GABAergic neuron that we'll consider is the so-called neurogliaform cell. These are small, compact cells which have an extremely dense axonal arborization close to their soma. What's specifically interesting about the neurogliaform cells is that along their axons, they form, of course, boutons and they release GABA, but they don't have an obvious postsynaptic partner. And so these cells seem to release GABA into the extracellular space, and they may then regulate the extracellular GABA concentrations, and they can signal via GABA B receptors, causing slow inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. So in this video, we've seen that there are quite different types of GABAergic neurons in the neocortex, and they appear to serve quite different functions. The parvalbumin expressing GABAergic neurons can fire at extremely higher rates,
are highly connected to the excitation neurons and probably mediate some form of fast feedback inhibition. The somatostatin cells, on the other hand, target distal dendritic elements, and they receive facilitating input from the nearby excitation neurons, and they presumably respond to quite different patterns of activity in the neocortex. And furthermore, their inhibition is of a rather different element in the circuit than the povalpum cells. The povalpum cells inhibit proximal areas close to the soma, the soma itself, axon initial segment, proximal dendrites, fast inhibition, whereas the somatostatin cells are inhibiting a slower form of inhibition at the distal dendrites. We also talked about VIP expressing cells that have an interesting role in disinhibition. They inhibit other inhibitory neurons. And finally, we mentioned neurogliaform cells that might be involved in controlling the extracellular space GABAergic concentrations and mediate slow iPSPs via the GABA B receptor. So there's a whole diversity of GABAergic neurons and a challenge for the future is now to assemble these different cell types, these different mechanisms, and see how that functions in the living brain during behavior.